Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. We've got the microphone on. So I'm going to talk about physician engagement. And so why don't we start with some audience engagement? And I want to throw a poll your way. Of everyone here in the room, raise your hands if in some way, in the course of your work, you're involved in trying to increase physician engagement at your organization. All right, good. I was hoping some people would raise their hand. <laughs> All right, so I do want to, so, so the fact that some of you are working to increase physician engagement, I think implies on some level that perhaps physicians are not engaged or perhaps not optimally engaged. So I first want to talk about both where and why physicians might be unengaged. And I'll use that to talk about how we can optimize physician engagement to achieve your organization's goals, particularly around value-based contracting. To do this, I want to start with what I call a tale of two eras, sort of two different times in, in modern healthcare. And I want to introduce to you what I think are the three key components to achieving success in the value-based world. I'll share them now and I'll elaborate on them a little later. So one of them is knowing and valuing your audience. When I talk about your audience, I mean who are the people that at your organization you can reach out to to help manage the levers that can optimize performance in the value-based contract. Another key component is process engagement. And the third is workflow optimization. Now, as I talk to you today, I bring the perspectives for, for my jobs, my experiences, and, and my, the hats that I wear during the course of a day, a week, and a month. So I am the medical director at MACIPA, the Mount Auburn Cambridge Independent Practice Association located just a few miles from here in Boston. And one of the jokes I sometimes tell, people don't always laugh, but you know, there's no I in team, but yet there is an I in IPA. We were one of the original pioneer ACOs. Right now we're Medicare Shared Savings and MSSP Track 3. We also work with Blue Cross and their alternative quality contract. And to achieve the success that we've been able to achieve, all these independent practices and independent physicians have to actually work together as a team. And so that's sort of the, the genesis for, for the title, engaging the eye in your team. I'm also a physician myself, and I practice, I'm an internist, and I practice primary care in Cambridge at the Mount Auburn Hospital just across the river. And the other hat I wear is as an educator. I'm on the faculty at Harvard Medical School, and I mostly teach continuing medical education to practicing physicians, and I also teach the residents in our hospital's training program. Fortunately, this month, or perhaps fortuitously, I actually have a commentary that's published in the American Journal of Medicine, or the Green Journal, which actually interdigitates with some of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I would encourage you all to, uh, to read that if you're interested. So now I want to take a journey back in time as I think about sort of a tale of two eras. So this is a time when I was finishing my, my training, my residency program, and I was interviewing for, for jobs, for outpatient internal medicine jobs. So the year is 1995. I'll give you all a few seconds to do the math. And I would say that at most of my interviews, what came up with something called the three A's. Is anyone here familiar with the three A's? All right, so not, not that widespread. So let me explain what the three A's are. So basically in 1995, and for decades prior, what they'd always say, if you wanted to be successful in medical practice, you needed to be affable, available, and able. So those are the three A's, all right? So basically, your patients had to like you, you had to be there for them, and you had to know what you were doing. And that kind of sufficed for, for a long time in, in healthcare. So let's look at the second era. And we're going to fast forward to today, to 2017, and someone's interviewing for a, you know, an outpatient primary care job. 
And you want to know, well, what are the key factors for achieving success? Well, the first thing you have to probably know is what are you doing about macro, right? Are you in MIPS? Are you in MIPS or are you in APM? If you're in APM, are you in ACO or in MSSP? If you're in Massachusetts, are you in the AQC? How are you submitting PQRS? What's your EHR? And so what you can see is that we've gone from the three A's, which I think are pretty easily understood, to this alphabet soup. If you went to most, or perhaps, certainly many, and perhaps most physicians in practice and asked them what all those acronyms meant, many of them probably wouldn't know. And so when you talk about a gap in engagement, Physicians were all about the three A's. Most of the physicians I know were certainly engaged in the practice and the delivery of healthcare. I think the challenge is finding that, that balance or, or bridging that divide, you know, sort of in, in the other components of healthcare that I think are poorly understood. And, and for many folks in, in clinical practice, they may have little interest as well. I mean, think about a physician going into an exam room to evaluate a patient who, say, has a headache, and they log into their EHR, and instead of coming up with headache guidelines or headache medication options, the first thing the EHR said is the patient's due for cancer screening, and they need two vaccines, and they haven't had their diabetes blood test. And so what I think we see here is an era, or sort of an area, perhaps also why sometimes we see poor engagement on the part of physicians. So let's think about or I want to sort of share with you the key components of the value-based contract and then revisit what I'm presenting as the three key components to achieve success in your value-based contract. So different value-based contracts are going to have different, different constructs, but I think as an overarching way to look at this, sort of my view of the world, we start at the top, and at the top is you need patients to have your contract, to have your value-based contract, and so that's your membership. Your membership has to be balanced by some measure of risk adjustment, all right? So you've got your membership and your risk adjustment so that if you have a very young, healthy membership, you have a different sort of financial starting point than a practice that has a population with more chronic disease that's going to require more funding to to maintain that population's health and their, their health care needs. So that's your top tier. Then your middle tier comes your medical spend, your utilization. Patients get sick, people need care. They get hospitalized, they see doctors, they take medications, they have tests and procedures. Now when you think about membership and then utilization, that was sort of the end of what I sometimes think about as capitation 1.0. And if you could, you know, dial down your utilization, you would increase your surplus and improve your bottom line. What the value-based adds is another tier, which is quality. I think about this as clinical quality, and I think about it as patient experience. And so now what happens is that as you work on your medical spend as you work on your utilization, you have to find that sweet spot between quality and utilization. If you dial down your utilization too far and you begin to have a negative impact on quality, your patients aren't getting the medications they need, they're not getting the preventive care they need, then even though you might achieve better savings and perhaps bring in more surplus, when the quality is factored in, you're going to have patients who are not getting optimal quality of care and perhaps not having the optimal patient experience. And so by dialing it up a bit and perhaps spending a little more money, but giving the patients the medical care they need, spending money for the appropriate preventive tests and the appropriate vaccines, you reach that sweet spot of optimizing care and optimizing your bottom line. And that is part of why I'm in this, why I do this, because I, you know, I'm happy to see an opportunity where both financial and clinical outcomes are actually aligned. 
So let's get back to the, the three components that are going to help you think about this value-based contract and optimize your performance. So the first one is to know and value your audience. For us, when I think about the tiers of the value-based contract, our audience is the primary care physician. For many of you, it, it could be similar. There also could be some organizations that have a different structure, and you may have a different audience. So I would encourage you, though, to think about your audience. And let me explain to you why the PCP, the primary care physician, is our audience. So I'm going to go back over those components of the value-based contract. Let's start with the patients, memberships, the membership. When patients are in a commercial HMO or a Medicare Advantage plan, they select their PCP, right? That's where the membership comes from. In our IPA, we task primary care physicians as well with keeping tabs and, and, and properly capturing risk adjustment or sort of risk adjusting codes in, in, in care delivery. And so as a physician is aggregating or, or dealing with you know, sort of the primary care needs of a patient across multiple conditions and multiple domains, they're tracking all those risk adjustment codes, they're submitting the codes, and they're maximizing the ability to, to, uh, you know, to get the revenue from the proper risk adjustment of that population. So primary care certainly owns the membership and, and the risk adjustment. And I'll say, as an aside, even if you're working in an attribution model, right, your patients are still attributed to a primary care physician. So that's our PCPs with membership and risk adjustment. So then I want to think about utilization. Now, certainly, if a cardiologist takes my patient to the cath lab, or say an orthopedic surgeon takes my patient to the operating room for an elective joint replacement, I have limited impact over that utilization. However, when I, you know, primary care doctors are still gatekeepers, and when I direct my patients and make recommendations and allow my office to approve or deny referrals, I think about, you know, which specialists are high utilizers and perhaps inappropriately high utilizers, and which specialists are doing procedures at very expensive locations that add no additional value in exchange for that higher cost. And I think about the specialists who don't have great patient satisfaction. And my patients come back and they have more questions than when they went that were unanswered. And so as a PCP, as a primary care physician, I want to direct my patients to the physicians who are providing the highest quality and the most appropriate care at the most cost-effective locations and providing the very highest level of patient satisfaction. And so, for that reason, even though primary care doctors don't control the entire world of utilization, we certainly control a significant portion of it. The other area where primary care can substantially impact utilization is around patient management. So primary care physicians can manage a lot of diseases in the outpatient world and also need that availability so that if your patient is, is not doing that well, they can come see you in the office instead of deteriorating and having to go to the emergency room and ultimately getting admitted. Right, a $100 primary care visit is a lot more cost effective than a $10,000 hospitalization. If you read my article, I cite some of our internal data, which actually shows an inverse correlation between the number of primary care visits and the rate of hospitalization for, for patients in a, in a population, in a practice. And so in a very real way, primary care physicians can impact substantially the utilization around hospitalizations, around rehospitalizations, by being available and by helping manage their patients as an outpatient. And so that addresses how PCPs, how primary care physicians, factor into the utilization picture. And then when it comes to quality, let's think about clinical quality. For those of you who are familiar with our range of, of quality measures in, in most contracts, particularly in, in you know, the ACO world uh, of, uh, of Medicare, many, if not most, of those measures are really managed in the primary care setting. And even though there are some specialists who may have one or two or three measures in their domain, in our organization, and I know in many others, 
It's the primary care physicians that are given the list of patients who have gaps in their quality performance, whether it's preventive care, whether it's chronic disease management, and it's our primary care offices and our primary care doctors that do the outreach to patients to make sure that all their cancer screenings are up to date, that their vaccines are up to date, that their chronic disease management is optimized. And then when it comes to patient experience, many of those questions are, are, are central to primary care. And as I said, certainly primary care doctors direct patients to where they believe they're getting the highest level of patient satisfaction and the highest level and quality of care. And so in exchange for this vital role that our primary care doctors play as our audience, as the folks who drive a lot of the success that we can achieve in our value-based contracts, we actually pay our PCPs more than 50% from our surplus because they play such an important role. All right, so that's knowing and valuing our audience. In addition, since they're our audience, we have to communicate with them. And so all of our primary care doctors are organized in pods, and every pod has a pod leader. As the medical director, I meet on a monthly basis with our pod leaders to talk about initiatives and, and, and quality and, and all the other sort of things that we have to talk about in, 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 uh, in, in an IPA, in an organization with value-based contracts. And we pay the pod leaders. We pay the pod leaders to go to the pod leadership meetings because we think it's important and valuable. And we pay them for their efforts when they go back and run their local pod meetings on a monthly basis. We also pay our primary care doctors to attend those pod meetings. Because again, you know, how many times do you see physicians who are not actually in the office getting paid for their efforts? We consider that extremely valuable and we pay physicians based on their attendance at the pod meetings. With my hat on as an educator, what I like to tell our, our primary care physicians is that they are the CMO of their medical practice. Okay, so every primary care physician is a chief medical officer of their patient panel. What do I mean by that? So any of you who are CMOs or those who are familiar with the role of a CMO, you're gonna be responsible for the care and the quality that your patients are, that your organization's patients are getting across all of your locations. As a CMO, you don't visit every site on a daily basis. You're certainly not seeing every single patient but to using your leadership skills to coordinate the very best of the people out there on the front lines. And in the same way, you know, our first speaker today showed a, a cartoon of a doctor with 10 hands, and one hand had a, a syringe giving an injection, another hand had a medical record, another one probably had a blood pressure cuff, right? As the CMO of your medical practice, you have 10 hands, but you don't have to do everything yourself with those 10 hands. And that's where the process becomes vitally important because probably few doctors are actually giving vaccines themselves and few doctors are probably actually checking blood pressures themselves. Yet physicians are responsible for making sure that the people in their office who check blood pressures are doing a good job and the blood pressure is under control. And the people who are giving the vaccines are giving the right vaccines, are giving it appropriately and that your patient's vaccine status are up to date. And by extension, we can take this process and spread it over the continuum of quality measures and key initiatives that are necessary to perform well at value-based contracts and at the same time, optimize the care you're giving to your patients. And so that's where the workflow becomes vitally important. So let me explain what happens in, in my office and, and many of the offices across our IPA. Any of you who are working with patient-centered medical home, PCMH, another acronym, will probably be familiar with the pre-visit planning workflow. But here's what happens in, in my office. So my medical assistant, several days in advance of my schedule, in fact, I'll bet she's doing it right now for, for next Monday. Actually, next Monday's a holiday. Next Wednesday. Um, is going through the list of people who are scheduled in advance for routine visits, so physical exams, chronic disease follow-up, maybe medication management. And she has a list of our three key cancer screening metrics, cervical cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer. And she'll identify people 
and determine whether they're due for that screening. So let's say I had a 55-year-old female on my schedule and they haven't had a mammogram in the past year. So she'll, she'll look in the record, she'll see the EMR doesn't have a mammogram listed, she'll call the patient. And she'll say to them, you know, you're seeing Dr. Shane on Wednesday, can I schedule a mammogram for you in the building that same day that you're coming in for the visit? We've reached a relationship with our radiology department as well so that we can schedule short-term visits and they'll generally even accommodate same-day appointments as well when needed. She does the same thing with chronic disease management. So she has a list of all the diabetes measures. And if my patient is due for a urine test, a urine microalbumin, which is screened for kidney disease and diabetes, which has to be done on an annual basis, the patient comes in, they haven't had it done, she'll collect the urine specimen, she has a standing order for me, and she'll send it off to the lab. And so when I walk into the room to see the patient, the mammogram's been taken care of, the urine microalbumin's been taken care of, she'll also take care of their diabetic eye exam. So if they haven't had an eye exam and they have diabetes, she'll call the patient. And if the patient says, you know what, I had it two months ago with, with this other ophthalmologist, with this other optometrist, she'll get the records. So when the patient comes in, it will be there for me scanned into the EMR. And if it's not been done, she'll help them schedule it. So I'll see, eye doctor visit scheduled next week. And so in this way, the process engages me, it engages the patient, the patient feels incredibly well cared for, and when I walk into the room and they have a headache, the first thing I can say to them is, so tell me about your headache. Not having to start from square one and go over their vaccines and their cancer screenings and their chronic disease management. So really in conclusion, what I hope I've been able to, to share with you today and, and, and help you all understand, that really in order to think through the optimal way to manage value-based contracts and to really achieve engagement by physicians as well as by patients and by office staff, you have to think about who your audience is, you have to recognize them and you have to value them. You also have to think about the key processes that you can employ to optimize the care that you're delivering and you do that through workflow optimization. And again, at the end of the day, as a physician, I want to make sure all my patients are getting good care. As a medical director, I want to make sure we're performing optimally in our, our contracts. And we can hit that sweet spot. We're actually doing both at the very same time.